there are few emotions more powerful than hope. It's a spark inside you that brings a smile to your lips, a light that shows on your face, a feeling that lifts your head and pulls you forward. These days, hope like that often feels hard to come by. Maybe you've experienced your share of disappointments, but real hope is what the Christian faith claims to offer. A joyful expectation for the future, based on true events in the past, which changes everything about my present. Hope Explored is a three session series for anyone who is looking for a hope worth having. Whatever you do or don't believe, this is your invitation to explore, to discuss, to question, to discover. This is Hope Explored. This was taken from Nehemiah chapter 9 verses 1 to 15. And in today's text, we're in the midst of what I referred to in my last sermon, the restoration of the people. The walls have been rebuilt, the cities again coming together, but all of that is meaningless without the people themselves returning to God. Foundational to that has been the reading of the law, the explanation of what it meant, and the people beginning to put that into practice. Simply being called the people of God, taking upon themselves again the name of Israel, these things are irrelevant without the life that accompanies them. The reading of the law wasn't merely an exercise in teaching the people a set of rules to follow, or festivals to celebrate, but if you like, was a refreshing of the covenant that the children of Israel had with their creator. Nothing new was put into place, but the knowledge of the promises and the responsibilities had been lost among the people as a whole. God hadn't forgotten his people, but they had forgotten him. We're now roughly two-thirds of the way through Nehemiah, heading for what will unfortunately be something of an anticlimax, a, refre a reflection of the reality of the human heart. But so far we have seen God hear the prayers of his people. He's provided for them, and he's protected them in the rebuilding of Jerusalem against resistance and threat. The rediscovery of the law has been a significant moment, but not an isolated one. They've now heard of God's faithfulness in history to the people that he calls, as well as seeing it play out in the events that have unfolded around them in their own lives. That they just celebrated the Feast of Booths was not incidental to that because part of the purpose of that festival was to remember how God had brought his people out of Egypt and kept them and provided for them in their time in the wilderness. It remembered and celebrated his faithfulness. So we bring it all together. The fact that they've seen God act around them, this fresh reading of the law, this renewed understanding of the God that they serve and what he calls them to. And we see this impact to people in the way that the law was supposed to. On the 24th day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together, fasting and wearing sackcloth and putting dust on their heads. Those of Israelite descent had separated themselves from all foreigners, they stood in their places and confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors. We see the law doing its job. It was never supposed to make people right because our natures make such a thing impossible. It was supposed to reveal, to make known who we really are, as Paul touches on in Romans 7, to, to act as a mirror and uncover the reality of our sin in the light of who God is. The Israelites might previously have been able to say they fell short of God's standards. They may have been able to acknowledge that the exile had been the result of sin, but the revelation of the law allowed them to see it clearly for the first time. 
which is why they respond in the way that we see in today's text. More than just expressing sorrow, we see a lived out representation of repentance. Beyond just regret, their actions seem to reflect a desire to change. The fasting, the sackcloth, the dust all serve to keep their focus, sharpen their attention on how they as individuals and as a nation have fallen short of what God called them to. And as part of this repentance, they separate themselves. The separation we see highlights the seriousness with which they were taking what God had said. This wasn't an issue of racism or any other such nonsense. After all, the very scriptures that they had just been through, the, the scriptures that had inspired this act, categorically stated that people were of one flesh and one family. No, God's covenant people were always supposed to be separated to God, which is included in the idea of being a holy people. It was always supposed to be the case that they were distinguishable from those around them, a, a distinct people. Instead, they'd become like the cultures around them. Rather than following God's practices and standards, they aped the behaviours and morals around them, to the point that they weren't meaningfully separate, uh, separate to God or from the values of the surrounding cultures. As we heard last week, the church must not find itself in this same position. If we simply reflect the standards, practices and values of the world around us, we aren't meaningfully the church of Christ any longer. At that point, we follow the world and put a Christian veneer on what we have decided are our core tenets. The very ones then saying judge not become the judges of what the church can and cannot teach. And I'm not even specifically addressing a particular issue, but rather the basis upon which we judge any issue. The people separated themselves because they knew without question that that is what the law called them to. The basis for what they did wasn't how it made people feel or how others behaved or even their own wants and desires. They couldn't play off God's characteristics against one another, emphasise his love and mercy over and against his holiness and purity. And the church, local, national or worldwide, faces trouble if we try to play off God's characteristics against one another. We are called and shaped by a gospel that perfectly marries all of his characteristics and cannot afford to minimise any aspect of who God is just because it's more comfortable or seemingly nicer to do so. In the sacrifice of Jesus, we see the love of the Father sending his Son to pay the debt that we owe. We see his grace in accepting that sacrifice on our behalf when we've done nothing to deserve it. His justice is on display because the sin cannot simply be waved away but must be accounted for. And on and on. His mercy, his holiness, his faithfulness all reflected in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. And all of this so that we, by recognising what he did for us, having confidence or faith in Jesus, could count as being just, righteous and pure before God. And it was the same for them as it is for us. Being the people of God wasn't an allowance to live as they liked because they were special in some way but rather served as a call to live to a different standard, being accountable to God, to what he has said, above any other consideration. We see in this passage that they humbled themselves. They separated themselves as they've been called to. They acknowledged their sin. They read, they confessed, they worshipped. 
And it brings to mind another passage from when the first temple had been built by Solomon after the death of King David, uh, from Second Chronicles 7. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace, and had succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heaven so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, to devour the land, or send a plague among my people, basically judgment. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. It's not a promise for us to claim, but a revelation of who God is. As it is so often with individuals, so it is with God's people. True restoration, full healing, meaningful change can only come as a result of an honest reflection of where we are. The law fulfilled and continues to fulfill the purpose of being a mirror. We can't use a mirror to actually brush our hair. We can't use a mirror as an iron for our clothes or as water to wash our face. But used properly, the mirror shows the degree to which we need these things. Shows us how we actually look. When I was nearly 18 stone in weight, I hated looking in the mirror. Because I didn't like the disconnect between how I saw myself internally and what the mirror showed me. But avoiding the mirror didn't make me slimmer. It just allowed me to deceive myself for longer. And avoiding what God says simply allows us to deceive ourselves as to our true state as individuals and as a church. They stood where they were and read from the book of the law of the Lord, their God, for a quarter of the day, and spent another quarter in confession and in worshipping the Lord, their God. As we said before, prayer is an integral part of the book of Nehemiah, and at the heart of today's passage is a prayer of adoration and remembrance. And notable is this, so much of what is said in this prayer is directly inspired by the words in the first five books of the Bible. They praised and prayed God's word back to him. Now, I won't read the whole passage through, but have drawn out these parts that reflect the whole. This is about who God is, and once again the faithfulness that he has shown. You are the Lord God who chose Abraham and brought him out. You found his heart faithful. You made a covenant. You have kept your promise because you are righteous. You saw the suffering. You heard their cry. You sent signs and wonders. You knew. You made a name for yourself. You divided the sea. You hurled their pursuers. You led them. You came down. You spoke. You gave them regulations and laws, decrees and commands. You gave them bread. You bought them water. You told them to go in and take possession of the land you had sworn with uplifted hand to give them. This was the God the people had lost sight of. Foundational to the restoration of the people had to be the knowledge of who he was and what he had done. They couldn't build this restoration around a false idea of God. They were each part of a covenant, a set of promises, responsibilities and contracts bound to a God who had bound himself to them. I was reflecting on this prayer last week as we, uh, as we sang uh, together in church, as we sang of 10,000 reasons. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. 10,000 reasons for my heart to find. The Levites were bringing out reason after reason after reason to demonstrate 
the faithfulness of God and his true character. The song reflects the same reality. The worship is inspired by both the nature of God and his actions. Biblical faith, regardless of the nonsense ideas about it that exist, is based upon the proven nature of God's character and faithfulness. It is a confidence based on who he is, and as such it is something that is strengthened by knowing him better, seeing his work through the history of his interactions with his people. It was entirely deliberate that the Levites drew out what they did. They wanted the people of God to see him and his actions in the lives of their forefathers. Pray with me that God would open up his scriptures to us, individually and as a church, that we might see the truth and value of his word Pray that this work in our hearts and minds would inspire us in a meaningful version of what we see in today's passage. Firstly, that we would submit to God and his ways, seeing ourselves as the people of covenant. A covenant defined not by our culture, not by our desires, nor even by years of church history and tradition. But a covenant defined by God himself and a covenant sealed by the sacrifice of Jesus. And secondly, that we would respond like the Israelites, with adoration, confession, worship and commitment, a response of appropriate humility to who God is, who we are, and what he has said. And finally, that our faith, as individuals and as a church, will be founded upon seeing God for who he really is. That our expectations will be shaped by what he has done and by what he has said he will do. Worshipping God as he has revealed, rather than creating a God in our own image, who thinks our thoughts and holds our values that we would have a faith shaped by the God revealed in Jesus. Amen.